Hi, I'm Bernie Flynn. At New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Saving lives, bone marrow and stem cell transplants, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the heart of academic medicine, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work, TD Bank, Caldwell College, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, each year, thousands of people benefit from potentially life-saving bone marrow transplants. The procedure is complicated, and donors are often hard to find. Now, here in the studio to help us understand more about this very important topic, we have Kimberly O'Connor, Donor Services Representative at Community Blood Services. Dr. Roger Strayer, Chief of Blood and Bone Marrow Cancers at the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Sherry Ann Glasgow is a bone marrow recipient. And finally, Christina Merrill, Merrill, who is a founder and executive director of the Bone Marrow Foundation. I want to thank you all for joining us. Throughout this program, you're going to see information that will help you find out more about the bone marrow um, recipient process, the bone marrow donor process. Uh, this is a program that's going to assume you don't know much about this subject because people don't know much about this subject. Is that true, doctor? I think it is. It's a very complicated subject. But, you know... Kimberly did this at 21. At 21, she decided to do it. How common is that? Uh, I think a lot of people, more and more people are donating. It's a fantastic thing to do. It's a way to help someone save a life. People who do it, very, very beneficent. It's a philanthropic thing to do, giving your own cells to help someone <coughs> save a life. Okay, so let's go through it. What's the it? The bone, bone marrow transplant. What is it? Bone marrow transplant is when a patient's bone marrow is replaced by a donor's bone marrow. And that means after a transplant's done, all of the blood cells and immune cells in the patient are now donor-derived. So the donor is donating permanently all of the blood cells and immune cells that the patient will have for the rest of their life. But when you did this at 21, a, what drove you to do it, and B, my understanding is you didn't want to know who the recipient was. First, I did it at my high school through a blood drive. I was unable to donate blood, so I went over to the table. They had told me everything I needed to know about donating bone marrow. And Excuse me, that was not on your mind? You didn't go in saying, I want to donate bone marrow. No, I honestly was did blood. not know what it was. It was blood that you went in to donate. Yeah. Go ahead, I'm sorry. And then I signed the release form and they swabbed my cheek and five minutes later I went back to class. Three years later they called me <laughs> and said I was a match for somebody. <laughs> Hold on. Three years later they call you back and say you're a match for someone for what? Each, a bone marrow transplant? Yes. Did you say why did I say I signed up for this? Or Absolutely not. What did you say? I said, oh my goodness, I will absolutely do it. You had no hesitation? No hesitation. So then, so fo I'm gonna, again, I'm going to assume folks don't know. By the way, can we make sure that we have up on our, on our screen, we are here on public television to help people get more information. The Cancer Institute, your organization is up there. The Community Blood Services Organization and the Bone Marrow Foundation, mm -hmm. a not-for-profit, all nonprofits, educational organizations, public awareness efforts, they're all up there. What did you do? Where'd you go? I went to my nearest lab corp, the Community Blood Services um, HLA registry, had faxed over all of my information and tests that they had want done, and I donated blood for them to test, and that was pretty much it. So, 
Where's the, where's the big needle? <laughs> None. What, what do they do to you? I was put under anesthesia. Right. And then they had extracted or harvested my bone marrow. Did it hurt? No. Come on. No? No. How long did it take? Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I knew also what it's all about. My sister was my, re um, my recipient. Your sister was your... Perfect donor match. Was your perfect donor match? Yes. So The first time? Yes. Did she think it was going to hurt? Oh, she told me it's very easy. Okay, your procedure is every, every different, but, but yours did not hurt. No. Hers did not hurt. You were out of work for a couple of days? Yes. As Just a precaution a or what? Just precaution. It did it on a, I did it on a Thursday, and I went back to work on a Monday. Did you tell everyone about it? Yes. So it's great. I mean, colleges, high schools, mm -hmm. people going into military service, they're recruited. They check off that they want to do it, and very often they do. So someone watching right now says, okay, I'm, I am interested, I am moved, I am motivated, I want to be a part of making a difference in the life of someone who needs it. When we're talking about who needs it, the recipients in a moment. How great is the need? The need is tremendous, and one of the issues we have with donors and donor testing and donor harvesting and the cost involved is that um, some insurance plans don't pay for it, or some of uh, the testing is not paid for. So you have to really um, have organizations like the Bill Morrell Foundation and other resources to help pay for all the costs involved. So it could be for the donor testing, the harvesting, or just transportation, or having um, the donor take a leave of absence for a couple of days from work. You know, all these um, costs involved, you know, you don't think about, but they all impact the whole journey. And what the does process. your organization do exactly? <clears throat> We provide financial assistance and educational support um, to bone marrow donors and to their patients and family members, and so that they can um, go through a very, um, you know, long and lengthy process of having this bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant, and have the financial support that they need. So, if someone were on your website, that would be what they would find. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about your situation. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Diagnosed when? 2003. You were told you needed a bone marrow transplant. Yes. Just so I can understand something, for purpose of uh, putting things in perspective, Doctor, um, Robin Roberts, um, one of the greatest broadcasters in, mm -hmm. in our industry, a terrific human being, much publicized case, she needed a bone marrow transplant, and I believe she got one from her sister, correct? Yes. Okay. That is, am I, I just want to be correct in putting things into perspective. But it's not always that a relative, a sister, a brother, whomever, that they would be a perfect match. 25% of full siblings match. Okay. So you needed one. Yes. Your sister was a match. Yes, she was a perfect match. Well, as you, case in point, well, as you were saying, I also have a lost a sister who, were, who was on the national registry list who did not, unfortunately, did not receive a, a perfect match. And she got, she, she deceased as well. Hold on. You lost a sister. Yes. Who, who was not a perfect match. Yes. In the, yes. And she was placed on the National Registry list, but unfortunately... She, she did not, not get... No. So time matters here. Yes, it does. Time matters, and, and it's, it's... I'll come back to you, so go ahead, Doctor. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's uh, sometimes hard to find a match for people who are of certain uh, ethnic and racial minorities. What, what, for minorities, for racial minorities, for African Americans, why is it harder? Well, uh, you know, we, we refer to a tree of life, and it's a metaphor for sort of the interconnectedness of all humans. But essentially, it comes down to the root, the base, the foundation of the tree is Africa 100,000 years ago, where all of the genetic diversity is. And then a small group moves up to the Middle East, and it gets uh, more and more restricted less and less diverse as you move out through all the different areas that humans migrate to. So you're saying Sherry Ann was a harder match because of where your family comes from? Because people who are of African descent, people who are uh, American Indian, uh, Asian, Polynesian, uh, Pacific Islanders, Hispanic Latinos, there are groups okay. where there's a lot of genetic heterogeneity and not a lot of people That's why in Robin the registry. Roberts 
was so great in that she came out with the with her um, myelodysplastic syndrome and having a bone marrow transplant. She was very open about it, and she has already put in about 56,000 uh, donors, um, African Americans. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You're saying because Robin Roberts did what she did, she's had a great impact mm -hmm. on encouraging people who happen to be African American mm -hmm. to put their names to, in the registry to go as be tested. To be tested, to be, to tested. be donors. Yes. And there's a great need for that. Yes. Go, go back to your case. Okay. So you have the bone marrow transplant from your sister. Yes. In 2000 and? Three. Oh, sorry, 2004. What so happens? Everything went well. Um, my first, because I, I received three dosage. The first dosage went fine, but like a, a year after I had a relapse. And then Dr. Stray along wanted to add more since I had left over. And still went well, also again on a relapse. And the third, the third dosage, like I said, um, third time was a charm. Everything mm -hmm. went well, and it created a little bit of side effect. But otherwise, I'm still here to you share my ten story. Year, I'm sorry for interrupting. You're 10 years cancer-free. Yes. What would you say to those who are waiting right now? For a transplant? Yeah. Oh, I would like to say they, can, um, they have to be patient. And to always have faith is the situation may seem hopeless, but it's the mind. It plays, of course, a lot of tricks on you. So you have to invest the time to feed it with positivity. If you take the time to um, um, concentrate on the negative where you say, OK, you're not going to make it, and to act passive, thinking passively, you will, um, you will always ultimately be defeated to the very end, to the very beginning. So you have to engage. It's a mental battle. It's not re pretty much a physical battle. It's a mental battle because you, you have to find, fight, fight so many storms mentally to convince yourself that you are going to make it. So it's, it's about inherit, um, sorry, investing positive, positive thoughts and act upon those thoughts, not to act passive. At the Bone Marrow Foundation, we have <clears throat> a program called Support Line where we... What's it called? <clears throat> Support Line. And, we and by the way, put up the website as it's being talked about. Go ahead. And we connect post-transplant patients with newly diagnosed patients so that they can keep positive and speak with patients that are out 10 years and mm -hmm. five years and, uh, you know, get the questions answered by them and just get the encouragement. So the emotional support doctor is huge here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And think about the story you just heard. In remission, have a transplant all the side effects in the hospital, in remission for a year, the disease comes back. And you need to get a boost from your sister. Yeah. And then, again, you need a boost, making the third time. It also highlights the strength of the transplant because what uh, Sherry Ann got the second and third time was a boost of immune cells. The transplant works by transferring her sister's immunity to her and then relying on those immune cells to travel through her body to find, target, and kill residual lymphoma cells. So the second two times, she got a boost of immune cells from her sister. You know, I imagine people listening to you right now uh, are motivated um, and you're being helpful on so many levels, but also on the other end with you. I'm, I'm curious about something. You talked about Robin Roberts moving a lot of people, mm -hmm. particularly African Americans, to, become to get tested and, and become... In the registry. Right. And you've become actively involved since you started donating at 21. To what degree have you influenced your peers because of your actions, not just because of what you say, but because of what you do? That's a good question. Um, I mean, everyone is completely supportive and happy. And Excuse me, did anyone say around you, come on? No. Everyone said, do this. Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, everyone that... I'm related to or friends with, they all knew that since I was little, I've always had this passion for helping people in any type of possible way. Um, 
even sports events, I would be the one kid standing in front of a store asking people for money to help support us. <laughs> and I would do it for like eight hours a day and be perfectly fine with it. And even when I got older, I started doing the Avon walk for breast cancer. I walked it. I raised money for it. I did more than what they had wanted to. And my grandmother actually passed away from that. But it was something that I wanted to do. And I've always knew that if there's someone out there who can help possibly make a difference, mm. why not do it? Even if you know there's maybe a slight chance that half of the people won't do it, there's still one person that will. What are the risks associated with being a donor? What we perceive as the risks are, there's a tiny risk of infection. There can be, sometimes it's done by having the bone marrow extracted right from the bone. Sometimes it's done by administering a blood hormone for three or four days and then having someone actually donate it from their blood. So for some people, it doesn't even involve the risks of any anesthesia. So the complications are very few, and probably the greatest complication is the inconvenience of having it done. What do you of mean taking a few Taking a few days off from work, going in and being examined, going through a very, very, very extensive donor health questionnaire, because you've got to be very careful about who's being accepted as a donor yeah, in terms talk about of their that. risks, in terms who's of... Who's out? Who, who's, who's out, anyone who's had hepatitis, anyone who has had risk factors for HIV infection. Even sometimes people are out because they've lived in areas that are endemic for malaria, and you have to make sure they're not going to you know, transmit malaria, other diseases. There's a very long list, a very extensive evaluation. I, I'm curious about something. Sure, Hans. Uh, Christina, you told our producers that 80 to 100 people 80 to 120 people come to them every month. To us for what? financial assistance and support programs. And, but that's just, uh, I mean, can only help around 40% of those patients because it's just, we don't have the budget to, to help everybody. But it's, it's a matter of, there's so many patients that need assistance and there's just not enough support out there. Okay, so I want to understand something else. With, with all the healthcare changes going on around us, all the healthcare mm -hmm. laws being changed around us, the healthcare environment, the paradigm shifting the way it has, was any of this addressed? Uh, well, was any aspect of this addressed? Well, a lot of the, as a lot of the um, costs involved it's never been addressed. It's never been addressed that there are donors involved that need to be covered, that there's uh, people have to take off a very um, a lengthy period of time from work. If it's a child, the parents have to be with the child in the hospital. They don't think so about no these, all, these, all these costs involved, no. So hold on. So when you took off, there was no reimbursement? No. So, so hold on. You, I said, what are the risk factors? And you were talking about the the clinical risk factors, the potential, the, the, the low level risk for, yeah. for infection. But you also said the inconvenience yeah. of taking off of work. Well, inconvenience is one thing, but loss of wages, of, of wages is another one. Sure. Mm -hmm. And if your employer were to say, hey, that's really terrific that you're doing that and we'll support you, that's wonderful. But that's not mandated. That's not some mandatory thing where the employer says, hey, that's great. You took off three or four days. Well, and I'm not even going to put you on the spot and ask you what happened in that way, because that's not fair. But isn't it a reasonable public policy discussion to have that that's a reimbursable it should be. item yeah, it should to be. encourage yeah, yeah. Encourage. people to become bone marrow donors to help those who are in need? Mm -hmm. Isn't that not a... And unless I'm nuts, I've never heard that discussion anywhere. Yeah, I, it's a very valid, um, you know, issue that should be raised. Can okay, I, good. Can I interject to say also, of course. it's not just donors that are coming locally or nationally, but international as well. Because yeah. my sister had to flew in from the Virgin Islands, and so of course take a couple of weeks off. And we, co we cover those costs. Get those you know, In terms of we help, the foundation covers costs of donors uh, to fly in from other countries okay. and to um, pay for their transportation, their air flight. Um, when so they're private here. organizations, I'm sorry. Yeah, private. A private organization like yours mm -hmm. that raises money privately. Yes. Does it. And if you were not doing this, who would do it? 
a lot of, that's what got me started. I was a social worker in uh, two hospitals, and I used to just give over my weekly paycheck to my patients because they were, um, they had no money to pay for food while they were in the hospital. They had no, a lot of patients were being discharged to homeless shelters. Uh, they, um, they don't have the financial resources, and it was just devastating to me, so I started the organization 22 years ago. You started yeah. the foundation because you were giving over your paycheck mm -hmm. to do what you're doing now, but only yes. on a smaller scale. Yes. I was and doing it to the patients that were, I was um, their social worker. The costs are extraordinary. Even if, the, even if everything was covered to the day of discharge, when the person, see, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a procedure, it's a process. Yeah, I, I looked at my notes, say, involving 40 to 50 people, doctors, nurses. All oh, yeah, we have a meeting every week to discuss yeah. each transplant coming up, and there's a, it's like a symphony. There's uh, transplant coordinators who are conductors, there's financial counselors, social workers, infectious disease doctors. Average cost. Average cost, over $100,000 just for the hospitalization and procedure, but then it gets expensive. Then you're After talking, the hundred grand. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> then you're talking about the ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month minimum in drug costs. Mm -hmm. uh, once the person leaves the hospital, and, and many okay, patients yeah. won't even get qualified for a transplant if they don't have that Absolutely. financial support to be able to be discharged, Absolutely. have a clean and sterile home, mm -hmm. to have medication, to have a caregiver to take care of them. So if you don't have anybody to help you. You can't go to the grocery store and do your shopping. You can't do all these things. You can't go out in public. How are you doing this at first? I'm, now, thank God, I have a good family support system, and also along with friends, there was everybody is there. With but me. you're not able to work right now. No, I'm trying to go back to work. That's my biggest problem at this point. But you have a heck of a family, because that's a lot of money. It is true. I, I'm I'm grateful every day. You, you don't know. <laughs> you can imagine, even if somebody has 80% covered, you're talking about $2,000 a month that has to materialize, and then there can be added costs. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very, very it problematic is. for most of the patients in the healthcare system. So, so it's so that. interesting. Like we, we do this, we, when we got into this, uh, this topic, I thought, you know, we'll promote people uh, you know, getting on the registry, donating, and doing what you did. And, hey, that's really terrific. And I'm thinking, Wow, we're doing a great public service. And then I'm realizing we're opening up this massive, complex public policy question. Mm -hmm. And it's great that people do that. But there's so many other parts to this. Yeah. It's a, it's a we, long but, journey. But it's a it real is, long journey for a patient. But don't let it detract from the initial mission, getting <laughs> those people on the, on the registry, because that helps a lot, especially the people of racial and ethnic but but let me also say this. Uh, I'm going to say this to our other producers who are part of, the, of this production. We have another program called Capital Report, which examines public policy questions um, in the state and nationally. This clearly is a, is a public policy program, excuse me, a public policy issue that needs to be explored more on that program. And we will do that with our producer, Natalie Sandys, in the control room right now. We need to look at that question and really ask those who are making public policy on the state and national level, why is there even no this? There's, am I wrong? Is there absolutely no discussion about this? Not no, anything no, I'm no. aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. You guys don't have a lobbyist, do you? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, apparently. That's, maybe that'll be your next foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, except that would cost, the, never no. mind. Um, <laughs> so we have a couple minutes left. What would be the message you want to send to if, people watching right now? Again, we can't solve. We'll put some of those issues on the table in our other program. That's fine. We'll begin that discussion. But... In an effort to move people in a positive direction, have some impact with this program, what would you say to folks watching saying, hey, she did a good thing. I'd like to do a good thing. What would you say to them? As they look at the websites, because they can follow up. Go ahead. Well, you can go to communitybloodservices.org. Um, on the top, you can click bone marrow, and you can even donate blood, um, and you can even donate cord blood if What's you need the, to. Explain the difference right there. Blood versus cord blood. What's the Blood you can donate that will go to patients in the local hospitals. Right. And cord blood is the women who give birth. They yep. can store the cord blood. I saw it done four blood. times. Oh, nice. I did not do it but because I did <laughs> not, as you know. But yes. a child of mine. But, but, so that's important because? It helps someone save a life. You can do it. You go on that website. You say, I want to donate cord blood. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the cord blood otherwise would be discarded. 
So the cord blood is a source of stem cells. You have donors who are related, Sherry Ann, you have unrelated donors, and you have cord blood. And the beauty of cord blood is cord blood requires less stringent matching requirements for bone marrow transplant, opening up cord blood uh, transplants, opening up transplant options for patients who otherwise wouldn't be able to find a donor. And it has to do with the biology of the immune system and the matching, but it, uh, suffice it to say that the matching for cord buds is much less stringent, and there are many people whose lives have been saved using cord blood when other donor sources were not available. So we would encourage, uh, just as was said, as many people as possible to donate cord blood to national and international registries. There's already 600,000 cord bloods banked. I cannot thank you all enough for being a part of the very important public policy discussion that is saving lives and making a difference, particularly to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, TD Bank, Caldwell College, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by PSE&G. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. I work for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield, and I'm a catastrophic case manager. I'm a nurse. I feel a sense of responsibility to each and every member that I speak with on the phone. I know where they live. I know their towns. I know the hospitals they go to. A lot of times I know their physicians, and um, I love helping people at very difficult times of their lives. The job I have now is the perfect job for me. I think I was born a nurse.